thank you. We're very honored and very pleased that you're able to work, take that time out of your schedule. I know you're busy to come and talk with us today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to AJ, and, and he can explain more what he's doing. Thank you, Dave. We're live now. Thank you. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Very good. We'll see you here in a minute. Good morning. Now, I'm going to have to ask you guys to do a little better than that because what what wasn't introduced as part of my introduction is that I'm a University of Illinois alumni. You can save your boots for later. And uh, my team is coming in to, to, uh, to Columbus this, this weekend to get our thumping from Ohio State, I suspect. <laughs> So I see some Ohio State shirts in the crowd. I, I'm guessing there's a few fans. So given the fact that I'm not going to, my team's not going to get good hospitality, I want some good hospitality. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Very good. So a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I was born and raised on a on a farm in East Central Illinois, uh, just on the in the I-70 corridor on the far east side of the state, a little town called Paris, Illinois, and my I'm still very actively involved in our farming operation. Um, in addition to that, I have what I would consider to be the coolest job in the industry, to be honest with you. I'm very lucky to get to do what I do, which is primarily high yield research. And in addition to that, working with growers across the US on strategies and practices to try to uh, drive yields further on their operations. And I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people, uh, people all across the U.S. one that was mentioned earlier, Randy Dowdy. Uh, I, I started with Randy back in probably 2012 um, in corn and was with him basically from step one of starting soybeans and, and going through breaking the world record there a couple years ago. So I had a lot of good opportunities. Uh, I don't have a ton of time today and I know that I'm I think the thing ahead of lunch I was told earlier so I've got a lot I'm going to cover and uh, I encourage you, if you've got questions for me, uh, that I always entertain questions through the presentation, or certainly there will be time to do that later on in the, in the event as well. Uh, I'll just start by saying that in today's world, quality info is difficult to come by, and you're here to get quality information. You work with Integrated Ag because they bring you quality information. Well, I've had some interesting experiences uh, with information and, you know, as we get into the age of, of uh, social media, you see all kinds of things that may show up on social media pages. So one of those that I had came from my own company, our communications group. And uh, I'm just going to pop this up. This was posted on our Twitter feed and see if you see any issues with this from where you're seated. It says, what's the longest stretch you spend in a cab during planting season? Hashtag plant 15. Anybody see any issues with that? I have at least as far as I know, I haven't seen a planter cab, planter tractor cab that looks anything like that. It would be a new one for me. So I had this sent to me by multiple farmers. I had to call up my communications counterparts and say, who in the heck published that and please get it off right now. So you just got to be careful where your information comes from. Uh, I certainly hope that we're going to share some quality info with you here today. A little about my philosophy, and uh, if we if we could you know, maybe pop up that first question while we're on this, so I can get a little info from you. Uh, my promise to all of you today is I am a fact-based, science-based uh, researcher. We do a lot of, of work; it's replicated, uh, real data that I'm going to share with you today. In addition to that, we do bring some personal experience into this. So. I'm making and losing money. The discussions about budgeting, you know, I'm penciling the same numbers you are. We're making and losing money with the strategies that we implement. So some things are very successful, some aren't. Um, okay. So, you know, one perspective of mine, I guess, is that uh, as you look at soybeans and soybean <coughs> management, uh, there's, there's two things that you'll find from me and, and my, my guess, my philosophies. One would be, that uh, you, you really have to, you got to look at um, soybean management as being, I guess my idea is I like to lead innovation rather than follow innovation. So I'm going to do a lot of things that you're going to look at that are kind of crazy. And uh, I guess my perspective would be to help 
okay, as we kind of go through this to understand where we sit as a group in terms of our yield. So I just asked kind of here to pop up where our soybean yields are as collectively as a group, because you really have to look at yourself and define what is success for you. Uh, success for you may be a lot different than success for an operation in, uh, in Georgia or in, in Central Illinois. So it looks like the majority of the room is somewhere between 55 and 65 bushel soybeans on average across the farm. It's not bad, very good yields. So uh, kudos to all of you in the room for that. Now just because something does or does not work for me, doesn't mean that it is or is not gonna work for you. So I'm gonna tell you some things that I think have been very successful in multiple locations, a lot of years of doing this work. I still am gonna challenge you to work with your advisors to try these things on your farm and see what does and does not work for you. You wanna grow more soybeans and make profit. We're talking about making profit here today. What are the things we're gonna to do to try to drive profit? I'm gonna throw up, here's like the, the one page synopsis of everything I'm, I'm gonna talk about the rest of the way. So you can scratch your notes and then fall asleep if you don't care beyond this. But uh, basically, as I look at how we've driven more yield across a lot of different locations, uh, there's really about six ways six things that I suggest if you're going to start working with me on 40 acres or 4,000 acres that you implement on your operation. Number one, planting date. It's the quickest way to get six to ten bushel. And I'll share a lot of things we've done there uh, in regards to that. Variety maturity group selection. I was raised, and, and seeding rates as well, I was raised in a, in a growing up, my dad would set the planter at 185,000 when we rolled out into the field planting beans, whether we started on April 25th or June 15th, <laughs> didn't ever change. Uh, that's not necessarily the way that we have seen success in our practices. We've seen more success by being kind of dynamic in our, in our soybean practices, not static, but dynamic based on the environmental conditions that we get. You gotta be willing to make adjustments. Seed treatments and inoculants, obviously, if I'm gonna tell you, we talked about planting earlier, I'm gonna also tell you that seed treatments are a part of that story. I also have, we've done a lot of work with, with inoculants as we push higher yielding environments. And one of the things that we tapped into with, with Randy is we went over 100 bushel soybeans and, and realized how much nitrogen it took to do that. We started actually double inoculating them. But as you push yields higher and higher, it's a tremendous amount of nitrogen that's required to do that for a soybean crop. Even at 60 bushel beans, you're using as much nitrogen as 225 bushel corn. A lot of people don't know that. Residual herbicides, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. If you're not using residual herbicides, please start doing it. Uh, everywhere I go, weeds are, are a disaster. I mean, weeds don't make you. So we gotta manage weeds. And then finally, uh, the other one that I would say has become a standard practice in the high yield profitable management system is the plant health fungicide and insecticide. <laughs> We've seen consistent responses as we push yields further in that sort of management practice. I've got a bucket with a lot of others. Um, I won't get to dive into a lot of that today, but if you've got questions about it, uh, that's probably where I get a lot of my questions uh, in regards to foliar fertilization, tissue testing, uh, putting down soil fertility ahead of soybeans, uh, row spacing. A lot of those aspects kind of fit into the others. We're doing research on all that trying to help answer and understand how those practices fit into this profitable high management system. Some of that is, it, 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 it differs based on, on your environment and your, your uh, yield levels. So if you take nothing else away from my presentation, this is probably one of the most important slides. Soybeans are light harvesters. It's all about harvesting as much light as possible throughout the growing season. And I will tell you, Raise your hand if you've ever seen a soybean plant abort a flower or pot. Pretty much everybody's seen that, but if you haven't, you're lying to me, and, uh, and I don't I don't like to hear that happening. So it's a, it's a source limited crop. It's going to throw way more flowers and pods on it than it's ever going to keep. The way we try to keep as much as possible is by acquiring as much sunlight as possible through the year. The other thing I'm going to tell you that we've really tried to drive towards is getting maximum light interception. So June 21st, longest day of the year, uh, longest, most light interceptions occurring there. We're trying to drive our soybeans into the reproductive stages by that date. So anywhere from R1 to typically R2, 
Um, that's when soybeans are going to grow from about here where they're kind of still fun to walk through to up here where they're not as much fun anymore. We're trying to drive light interception, maximum light interception in those stages because of how critical photosynthesis is from R1 to R3. And I'll show you some examples of how we're trying to do that. So three ways that, that we can get more yield in soybeans. These are the only three ways we can do it. And uh, I'll give you one quick story here. The first time I presented this internally to one of my, or to my team of uh, technical advisors, one of my guys said, hey, AJ, I love the way you put this together. It's got a nice visual, helps me understand what things I have to do to influence yield. But I got a real problem with that picture in the middle there because there's a guy with a, a denim Wrangler shirt, curl snap, you got dirty fingernails, and it's just not professional for me. It's not doing it. You got to change that picture out. I said, Jared, I appreciate your feedback, but I got to tell you, that guy in that picture is my dad, and uh, he's holding a five bean pod from my farm. So my friend, that picture is not going away anytime soon. <laughs> that was an insert foot in mouth opportunity for him. We all get those at some point in time. But these are the three ways we're going to influence yield. We have to understand how the practices that we're putting into place influence these factors. And if it's not influencing these three, it doesn't belong there. I'll talk a little bit about uh, which of these, these factors or these uh, pieces of that puzzle are easiest to influence. There are some that are easier to influence for more yield than others. We'll get there here in a little bit. So as we look at kind of building a system and how we manage for more yield, the first way we've done this is through planting. And I'll give you uh, my historical perspective on this. I was, as I went through agronomy school, I was always taught, and tell me if you've heard something similar, that you don't plant soybeans until soil temperatures are 50 degrees in the first 24 hours. Heard that before? That was pretty common, a pretty common uh, theme that, that the, the concern, I guess, was that in the first 24 hours, you're in the imbibitional phase. So I'll give you an, an example of what the imbibitional phase might be like. I was in Nashville giving a presentation on a Saturday and uh, some, uh, after I finished, one of my co-presenters, it was my birthday, he said, hey, let's go over to this place across the road and just have a celebratory drink after we finish. I got over there, and uh, he had three shots of different liquors lined up waiting for him. So it was my birthday, and he put me in the imbibitional phase that I had to take those whether I wanted to or not. That was <laughs> unfortunate for me because my night ended very early. Uh, <laughs> Soybeans are in the same situation. They will drink water whether it's 35 degrees or 75 degrees. They're going to they're gonna do that in the first 24 hours. After the first 24, go into the osmotic phase. That's less of a concern. Now, here's the issue. Do you think, if I'm going to tell you to plant earlier, that there's going to be times where we're pushing into soil temperatures less than 50 degrees? Probably going to be. So we needed to help, help understand and, and see whether technology today and varieties could handle this differently than they had in the past. Because that's going to be a, a key aspect to, to making this work. The other thing that we needed to understand, uh, I don't, I'm not showing the corn research today, but we've done a lot of, of work on uniformity of emergence in corn and have found that typically you want to get all your plants up within 48 hours of each other in, in a corn scenario because after 48 hours, it becomes somewhat like a weed. We needed to understand how that impact or that influence would happen in soybeans. Did uniformity of emergence matter? Because if we were planting earlier, we probably were going to have issues with uniformity of emergence. So we did uh, some work here, let me see if I can get the laser pointer, where we put out golf tees based on different timings of emergence, a different color of golf tee, and we went out there every 12 hours and marked new emergence. What we found in soybeans is it was very different than corn. It took five days for uh, differential and emergence for yield impact to occur. So that was a good thing, I guess, in some regards, <laughs> that we had more wiggle room and weren't as dependent on uniform emergence as we would be in corn. Okay, so we had all these things kind of going for us. We started in 2015, so our research site is just outside of Champagne, so latitude, longitude were pretty similar to where we're sitting here today. And, uh, you know, at, at, at when I first started kind of doing this research probably eight or nine years ago, a lot of the farmers that I would work with would say, AJ, I mean, I hear you. I, 
I, I sort of believe you, but there's three issues here. Number one, I don't plant soybeans until I finish planting corn. Number two, I really don't want to plant soybeans until I can wear shorts in the planter. And number three, I also don't like to plant soybeans until I can sit my bare behind on the ground for some unforeseen amount of time. I, I never <laughs> understood that one, but I that would be creepy too. So in 2015, we had consistently been seeing uh, some benefit to these late April planting dates. We decided to push the envelope a little further and go to April 1st, just to try it out and see what happens. Well, it just so happened, the short synopsis is that uh, we got a couple frost events on, on that planting date after emergence. Uh, we planted corn on the same date. Our corn planting date on April 1st was the worst of, of any in that particular year. Uh, and the soybeans were, were the best. And those frost events frosted off 10 to 15% of the corn plants above um, soil level and soybeans, it, it barely bothered them at all. So after doing kind of multiple years of this work, I found that if you go below at 28 degrees, you're in, you're, you got some problems in soybeans. If you're from 28 to 32, you can actually tolerate that pretty well. So risk and reward associated with this, but the reward in this particular year was more yield. And I'm a big person believing in, if I'm gonna share information with you, I'd better provide some science so that it makes sense as to why we're seeing what we're seeing. And one of the things that, that we knew about soybeans was that uh, they're photoperiod dependent, right? So what does that mean? Well, it means as you get past the longest day of the year, as your day length starts shortening, that soybeans would flower based upon maturity group. The earlier maturity groups would flower first. Well, if that was the truth, or if that was the total case, you would expect that if you planted earlier, all that would really do for you is extend vegetative growth, right? Is that a fair, fair assessment? That was our assumption. Well, um, probably one of the worst jobs to have is one of my interns because they get a lot of tough projects. So if you ever want demoted, uh, that's, that's the place to be. Uh, but one of my interns is actually responsible for growth staging a big trial that we have every year, four maturity groups, multiple planting dates. She was responsible for growth staging that every day. It brought us a lot of interesting info because if you look the screens here, it's a little tough to see, but the orange bar is a combination of the April, late April and early May planting dates. So they were all very similar, May 1st. The green bar is May 22nd, the yellow bar is June 5th. One of the first surprises to us was look at the vegetative, number of vegetative days. It didn't matter whether we planted April 15th, April 17th or May 1st, or May 22nd, clear out here in the green bar, we had the exact same number of days in vegetative growth. That was a surprise to us. What did that mean? That was a big deal because it meant that if we planted earlier, we could actually get soybeans flowering ahead of the summer solstice. So we weren't purely photoperiod dependent. We were also heat unit accumulation would drive flowering soybeans. So that could be a big benefit potentially and maybe why we were seeing some benefit to that earlier plant. Out here at R5 to R7, no difference. Didn't matter whether you planted uh, April 15th or June 5th, we spent the exact same number of days in those stages. That was also a surprise. We're out here at Seedville. Where did we see the, the major difference? It was actually in that red circle in R2, full flower. So we picked up an additional eight to 10 days in that stage. What did that mean? That meant we put more nodes on per plant because we spent extra time in those stages where the soybeans are growing uh, vegetatively still while they're flowering, more nodes, more places to put pods. So these are all very uh, important things to understand um, as we move forward and, and try to see, understand the science of why we might be seeing these earlier planting dates being beneficial. We rolled into 2016 and we thought, no, oh, what the heck, we tried April 1st, let's try to break this thing and, and let's plant March 21st. You guys want to, anybody want to plant in March in Ohio? Probably not real interested in doing that, right? Um, you know, most people in our neck of the woods in Illinois would say the same thing. But hey, what the heck? I got free seed. If it, if it messes up, I just do it again. So it's worth trying. Um, the interesting thing was planted made March 21st. Those soybeans sat in the ground for 30 days, 3-0 did not have uniform emergence whatsoever. 
and yet we were still at 88% final stand versus target with a 37 degree first 24 hour temperature. 37 degrees. Now, if I was going to tell you how you want to go plant into sub 40 degree soil temperatures, you probably wouldn't think that was a really great idea initially, would you? But this was really, you know, our first look at uh, ultra early planting and, and seeing some some potential that, you know, we could have confidence that even in mid-April, um, those soil temperatures, we could get a good emergence out of that. I've got a lot of other planting dates. I'm not going to be leaguer for the purpose of this today. I just will stress that soybeans are much more capable of handling stress than we may have ever thought they were. And it could be somewhat genetic, could be somewhat seed treatment related. <clears throat> One of the other things that, that we can capture from a data perspective is the number of days from emergence to maturity. So why might this be important? Well, I've already told you, we're trying to intercept as much light as possible, capture as much source as we can. And if we can extend the amount of time that those soybeans are out there in the field, potentially that allows us to extend the amount of light that we capture. So we see this trend here. This is an average across four maturity groups at each of our planting dates. Um, these would be maturity ranges from the late twos to a late three, basically, in this particular case. And you see the big linear swing in the total amount of days uh, that these, these went from the day they emerged to the day they reached maturity. Interestingly, when we overlay the <laughs> yield data to that, it correlated almost, um, almost exactly to that. And in this case, in 2016, that was almost a 24 bushel swing from top to bottom. 24 bushel, that'll make you make you want to think about doing something different um, for, for a 24 bushel game. These March beans, what happened with those? Well, you know, one of the big challenges I've always had in soybean management is maintaining pod clusters on top of the plant. It's a real challenge to keep those clusters. We can throw the flowers, start the pods, but keeping them is a challenge. But that's a tremendous amount of yield that can be captured. That's something I see frequently when I'm down with Randy or down in, with some of the high yield guys in Arkansas. They maintain those pods up top. But how could we do that? Well, this was really the first time in this particular case I was able to maintain those pods on top of the plant. And lo and behold, for two years in a row, the crazy early planting was our best beans. What the heck? Man, never would think that this, I never thought this had a chance to make it. They had multiple frost events on them, kept on going, and uh, see the yields there. Okay, I've already told you that I'm a science guru. I better understand why this is happening. So complicated chart that I'll walk you through and help maybe understand and explain why we're seeing what we're seeing. This is solar radiation. And if you, if you aren't looking at solar radiation, this may be something to start thinking about. The solar radiation accumulation for our location where we grew the 100 bushel beans. That right across the center line there is the 10-year average of solar radiation accumulation. The lines above and below are the daily deviations, the yellow bars, from above or below the 10-year average. And the blue line is the running cumulative versus the 10-year. Okay, so a couple things I want to point out. If I pop on the screen here, March 20, the March 21st soybeans started flowering on June 5th. So we were over two weeks ahead of the summer solstice with those. And if you look at solar radiation, what, what did it look like for the first month after those soybeans started flowering? Looked pretty good, didn't it? We were way, way, way above average solar radiation there. If I throw on May, uh, <coughs> if I throw on the May 23rd planning date, or May 25th, I think it is. Uh, that up there that they started flowering on about July 11 okay July 11 what happened for the first month after the May 23rd started flowering we're in R1 we were way below way below on solar radiation there was a 25 bushels difference between those two plants could light interception in the early R stages and early flowering on those soybeans have made a big difference in this case. 
I'm going to argue it did. That this solar radiation was a driver and why we saw what we saw there. In 2017, this past year, I was in North Carolina, second week in February, and I got a call from our site manager. She said, hey, Dave, I don't even know if I want to tell you this, but it's getting close to being, okay, it's getting close to being uh, dry enough for us to be able to possibly plant some beans. So I thought, well, first I started getting kind of a twitch. Because I was in North Carolina, I knew that I didn't have the planter set up and I didn't have the seed or any treated seed. This was a problem. So I rushed back, cut my meeting short, got back home. Uh, we got ramped up to go, got the planter ready, went out. I was in a just a long sleeve shirt. It was about 70 degrees that day. We planted on February 19th. Anybody want to plant beans in February? <laughs> oh, now this, this, this is truly crazy, but... We were doing it to try to really push the envelope and, and again look at the scientific side of things and what you know what could we break or reach a breaking point by pushing it this planting early. So March 13th, it snowed. We had snow on the ground for several days. At uh, our soil temperatures at two inches after that snow event dipped below 30 degrees. I went out to try to have a rest in peace party for my beans because I said we've finally broken it. And I couldn't even dig them up because it was frozen. So I had to wait. And then lo and behold, 50, five, zero days after we planted, they started coming out of the ground. Five, zero, 50. And I thought, well, apparently I'm never going to break this thing. Uh, this, I never thought this had a chance to work. Now, granted, we still have a long ways to go because I anticipated getting a, a frost, a hard frost after these emerged. Uh, it just so happened that we didn't in, in 2017. So a word of advice. I'm going to tell you that I manage, I'm a big proponent of managing seeding rates if you plant earlier. I like actually to see lower seeding rates, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit. But if you're going to plant in February, uh, I planted 110, 125, and 160,000. Don't plant 110,000 in February because believe it or not, if beans sit in the ground for 50 days, you will get some attrition. You will actually lose some beans. So uh, we, we lost a little bit of stand versus what we targeted. We were at about 49% across our three populations. But the beauty was we could still harvest them. We had final stands at the low end at about 45,000, at the high end at about 90,000. And we got these things, got to watch them all the way through harvest. Uh, you can see I have a lot of other planting dates there. The one other one I would point out, we planted March 22nd again. So another late March planting date. We were out there in literally coveralls and face masks. It was so cold that day. And it was 35 degrees in the first 24 hours. And guess what? 83% final stand versus target. 35 degrees in the first 24 hours. It was cold after we planted those. We had actually had six growers in central Illinois go commercially plant beans on March 23rd and March 24th um, based on what they had seen uh, in our research and gave it a shot. And several of those guys had their highest yield fields come out of that planting date. So it was kind of neat to see it. It's obviously a risk, a big risk, but um, in today's environment, the treated seed and potentially free replant, there, were, there was the reward and the risk was the, was the balance there. So, Similar situation here, number of days from emergence to maturity. You see the trend in 2017. The yield swing wasn't as big as it was in 16. I'm going to share a couple of reasons why I think that was the case. But nonetheless, we're still looking at six to eight bushel. And for two years in a row, not that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating. No, walk out of here saying AJ said go plant in March. And that's a decision for your own farm. But for two years in a row, our March planting dates across multiple varieties had our highest yields. So one year, for me, one year is an anomaly. Two years starts to be a trend. And we've seen two years in a row where, where that has worked. What about the February beans? Average final stand, 65,000, and they almost made 80 bushels. Planted in February. That was even hard for me to believe. Uh, of course, an, an anomaly of, of the year in 2017. It's not looking good. I was just looking at the extended forecast. It's going to be like in the teens and 20s through about February 15th. So I'm not feeling really good about 
my February planting happening this year. But you never know. There remains to be seen. Why did we see maybe not as big of a, a benefit in 2017? I'm going to say, take a look at solar radiation again. It's almost a polar opposite of what we saw in 17. In 2016, you see way below average solar radiation early in the year, and then that line just gradually grows and grows through the end of the season because we had a lot of solar radiation late this year. And I would guess that you guys had a, had a somewhat similar situation. Um, a lot of solar radiation late. The one trend that's popped up two years in a row, I just that arrow is pointing to June 21st in that calendar. For two years in a row, our maximum solar radiation was occurring on the two weeks on each side of June 21st. So remember when I said we're trying to get those beans into reproductive phases, that's why we're trying to take advantage of all that light at that time of the year. So what's changed and why have we gone from thinking that we don't plant beans until uh, we've got to wear shorts in the planter to what I'm what we've been doing in, in our research, I think certainly genetics, seed treatments play a part in that. A couple other reasons why I think we've had some success with this earlier planting would be rainfall patterns. I'm gonna show you ours and challenge you to take a look at that for your locations as well. And then we kind of touched on the sunlight by growth stage, but I'll give you a little more perspective on that. This chart shows our, my moisture trends. So yours may be different, but I think this is worth noting because I also think this is a reason why we've seen benefit to the earlier planting. I was, so the orange bar in this case is 1971 to 2000. The blue bar is 81 to 2010. So you're just looking at the shift in the trends. And I'm a big proponent or big believer in putting yourself in the best position to succeed. And I, I was raised on August rains make soybeans. Heard that one before? That was what my dad always pounded into me, you gotta have August rains to make beans. Well, if, if at our location, if I'm reliant on August rains to make soybeans, I'm probably got some issues. Would you agree? Because look at May, June, and July. I'm sorry, I'm having some issues again. Uh oh. Pop up. So if I look at May, June, and July, uh, we got we got some issues, but I can keep talking. Um, I'll keep I'll keep talking because I can keep rolling through this, but we may have to reset this thing. May, June, and July, we've got moisture above. The trend is moving towards more moisture in those months. In August and September, it's less. In our case, a half inch less in August. So this is something important to understand too, because this is probably one of the reasons why we're seeing these early planted soybeans to be more successful. My next slide is, uh, is actually looking at the different growth stages that we get those beans to by June 21st, based on planting day. And what it shows is that any soybean, any of our soybeans planted from mid-May into June do not get to the reproductive phases by June 21st. They are only in vegetative growth. Now, if we plant in April, um, so mid to late April, all of those beans at least get into the R1 stage by June 21st. So we're, and that's regardless of, we have maturity ranges going all the way to a group four, early group four, and all of those got into at least R1. When we, and many of them actually got into R2. And our kind of extreme dates, there we go, our extreme dates, um, here we go. Okay, so now you see the white, the the white that's all vegetative growth, where we've got the white in the boxes there. And then May and June, when we're in April, you see R1. The blue, the yellow is R1. The blues are R2. So this is June 21st, and we've got everything at least R1. A lot of them in R2. When you go to the very extreme of, you know, probably not realistic, but just to give you perspective, our February beans actually started flowering in May. May 31st, and we were spraying our R3 fungicide applications on June 21st. So it just gives you an idea and why, you know, pair it with the sunlight, why I think that piece of the puzzle is really important. Okay, I'm gonna transition here and talk about a few other pieces of this puzzle. 
that you know, I mentioned it's a dynamic system, it's not static. I'm not gonna touch a lot on variety selection. I have a lot of opinions on that. Um, and your maturity ranges probably aren't too far from a lot of what we plant. So if you wanna catch me one off, we can do that. But for the most part, you guys, you know, you know your varieties better than I do for this location. What I do wanna show you a little bit of info on is uh, row spacing, plant population, and maturity groups. And how we make those selections or adjustments based on when we're able to plant. So I'm a, a big proponent of early planting its lower seeding rates. And it goes against counterintuitive to what a lot of people historically think, but the issue, anybody ever have any issue with beans logic falling over? It's probably, it drives me crazy. This, uh, this is the one thing that, that uh, I hate more than anything else is beans falling over for me having to walk through them and for what it causes a yield loss. So one of the ways that we try to manage lodging is lower seeding rates early. And the reason being, if you get too high of seeding rates, those plants are trying to outgrow each other. You get spindly stalks, they grow taller, taller, and taller, and then they lodge. If you can lower seeding rates, you get bigger, bigger stems on those plants. You're putting more nodes on per plant than you plant earlier. So you've got that benefit going for you, and you can somewhat, you may not alleviate lodging, but you can somewhat reduce it. As you move into later, later into the year, I'm going to call mid-planting, say, from about May 10th to May 25th, and then late planting, you know, anything as we get into June, you're just continuously raising those seeding rates as you go, because later planted beans don't put on as many nodes per plant. you got to make up for fewer nodes by putting more plants out there as you get later. In terms of maturity group, what we found, and I'll show you some data here in just a minute, plant early long season beans. We continuously found for us that longer season beans planted earlier give us more yield. Now, if you're getting a harvest premium for uh, getting some beans hauled in in early September, then it's a different situation. But uh, economics comes into play there. But uh, in terms of purely on the yield perspective, that's the trend that we have seen. If we have a year where we can't plant until May 15th, it rains all of April, this happens. I know multiple years on our farm, we can't plant till Memorial Day, it seems like. It just rains and rains and rains. In that scenario, our opinion or our data shows that we see very little difference between our mid or our early season beans and our long season beans. So in that planting range, we're gonna start with our early season beans. And if we get, the reason being, because as we get later, so in the late May and early June, the long season beans come back to show a more benefit. So we're gonna finish up with long season in that case. But early planted, our trend has been for um, higher yields with our longer season beans. Let me show you a little bit of data on, on uh, seeding rates here quick, and then in a minute I'll have them post up another question on row spacing. But, <laughs> In 2016, our research was all done in 30 inch rows. All right, in 17, we added 15s. So I'll show you that data here in just a minute. But just keep in mind, this is all in 30s in this case. I'm gonna show you basically yields by seeding rates at these various different planting dates. Our seeded rates were anywhere from 128 to 192. So 128, 160, and 192. Our final stands were pretty consistent in 2016, around 116, 145, and 173 in 30 inch rows. So if we start at the bottom, April 18th, the green bar is the lowest seeding rate. 116,000 final stand was about three and a half bushel better than 145. A lot of that was in lodging. The higher stands lodge anywhere from a week to two weeks earlier than the lower stands. And in that yield environment, uh, that made a big difference. What you'll see as I keep clicking these forward is as we progress later in planting dates, that gap just continues to close and narrow. Um, and by the time we get up to June, we see that we flip flopped and uh, the best yields are coming from our higher seeding rates in that case. So there's 30 inch rows. And the one thing I'll say about population, I, uh, we farm in very, extremely variable soil types at home. So we may have four or five soil types. 
They go anything from pretty good uh, lighter timber soils that we can raise 85 bushel beans to, in the same field, a knob that raises no better than 40 bushel beans. The way we manage that is I write variable rate prescriptions for soybeans, um, where in those areas I'm increasing seeding rate where we have lower yield potential to just try to get more plants out there to get more nodes. And we're lowering seeding rates in our higher yielding soil types. I write two prescription maps. I write one, assuming I can plant in April. I write another one in the case that I can't plant till May. In 2017, there were a lot of stand challenges. I don't, I'm guessing that at some point in your career, you've had soybean stands that you looked at and you were sick about them. Probably corn too. There were a lot of stands, I walked a lot of fields where you'd be 70,000, 60,000, 50,000, 30,000 in one part of the field get into another part, it's 125 or 130,000. Now what the heck do we do with that? Um, there was a lot of that and it's hard to look at narrow row beans with really thin stands. It's, it's not aesthetically pleasing, as they would say. What we discovered in, in, our, uh, in our first year of doing replicated work with 15 inch rows versus 30s, that the 15 inch rows with the exact same seeding rates, tended to have anywhere between 10 and 20% lower final stands than 30 inch rows. And it's, it's all physics. It's 30s, you got more friends right next to you that help push through a crust, and 15s, you don't have as many friends. So, and, and if you are someone who is bothered by thin stands and you plant narrower rows, you're probably gonna wanna have higher seeding rates than you would in the 30. Now where I might, say in a good yield environment in the 30s, we may go to 120 plant and stand. In the 15s, that number might be 140 or 145, for example. Now, I'm gonna show you the yield data in a minute and it's going to just basically refute everything I just told you. But, uh, but that's, that's just if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to look at thin, look at thin stand. Um, can we at some point here pop up that, that question two on row spacing. I'd be interested to see that. I'll keep kind of showing some slides as they bring that up. But uh, 2017, we added 15 inch rows and we dropped to just two seeding rates because of the addition of the narrow, the narrow row beans in there. I'm very curious about row spacing in, in the room too. So if you don't mind, take a quick minute and just let us know where you're at on row spacing and soybeans. The 30 inch row beans, as I kind of click this slide forward here, we had 128 and 155 planted stands in both 30s and 15s. I've got the final stands in each of the bars because in 2017, our final stands differed a lot based on planting date. And then you can see the yields out on the end there. So I'll flip through these and what you'll notice is that there's very little difference. And maybe when you get out into June, we see the higher seeding rates being more beneficial, but really there was a half bushel in the 30 inch row scenario to being at a 155 seeded rate versus 128. And it looks like, no, I'm not surprised by this at all, that uh, the majority of you in this room are in some sort of narrow row configuration. And in other parts of the world, I was just in South Dakota yesterday, uh, they were almost all 30 inch rows, which uh, it's kind of counterintuitive a lot of the issues that they have, but uh, a lot of narrow rows here. So this next piece of this is going to be very relevant to you. 15 inch rows, 128 and 155. We had some horrible stands. We had final stands in our March planting dates of 75,000. It was bad. They were ugly. But guess what? It was the best yield we had in the entire trial. 75,000 final stands per as I flip through these, you'll see in the 15s that we had some pretty low stands, and yet there wasn't any benefit to being any higher. So we got out to June, and then there was. Pretty, this, this surprised me. And I knew low seating rates we could get away with, but uh, some of these ugly final stands that we had still producing those kind of yields was, was a real surprise to me. The high population advantage wasn't an advantage at all in 15. It was basically a wash. 15s, 
narrow row configurations. I'm a, I'm a believer in them for a lot of different reasons. Yield would be one of them. This is just one year of data, so I get to call it an anomaly for year one. We'll do this again in year two, but year one, three bushel for 15s. My theory when I went into this research or started it was that we would see more of a benefit to, um, we wouldn't see as much of a benefit to narrow rows planted early because my theory was we get so much growth early that we could do just as well with 30 inch rows. I didn't see that either. Even in our March and April planting dates, we had more yield, significantly more yield in narrow rows. Again, one year of data here, but uh, you know, the pretty strong trend here for, for the narrow row space. <clears throat> we think a lot about light. I've got an intern here holding what we call a soybean selfie stick. That's circled in the, the orange circle there. That's a little camera on the end of a wand that takes a picture from underneath the canopy and gives you an idea of how much light is being intercepted by the plant versus the ground is what this does. Gives us some really cool visuals. So in this case, I've got the planting dates vertically lined up April 13th and May 18th. The row spacings uh, horizontally, 15s on top of 30s. These photos were taken on June 21st, the first set. I'll show you the data that would, this correlates to how much light's being intercepted by the plant. You see that 15 inch rows, it's about 20 to 30% increase in total light interception. And uh, our May 18, 15 inch rows are almost intercepting as much light as our 30s planted in April. Obviously, there could be a benefit to that of, of intercepting more light, like we talked about. What would be the other benefit of eliminating 25 to 30% of light from hitting the ground? Heck yeah, keep weeds from coming through, right? What if we fast forward three weeks? 95% is about the best we can do in these with this camera in terms of total canopy closure. Our April 13th was at 95%, but it took three months to get there. So I'm not going to touch on this today, but part of the issue with the earlier planning is weed management in that system because you put a lot of pressure on your, your program to perform for a long period of time. You look at the May 18th, 15 intros, they've actually lapped over the early planted 30s in terms of total light interception. So three weeks difference that you can see what, what's happening. All right, so one other thing that I just didn't touch on very briefly. I had a lot of questions, you guys have probably dealt with it as well, about when you've got a really thin stand, should you intercede? Should you start over or should you leave it? Anybody ever had that decision to make? <laughs> Makes you want to beat your head on a wall, doesn't it? You gotta do it. Well, because we had a planning date that had some really, really horrible stands in May due to crusting, we took that and we actually interceded, left some really low stands, interceded into some others, and then planted a whole nother planting date to simulate a total replant. I'm going to show you that data here real quick. Um, we planted, the original planting was May 18th. We interceded and replanted June 2nd. The bottom line is, if you look in the lower end on the 30 inch rows, there's not a lot of 30 inch row guys here, but for those that are, in the 30s, it actually gave us a yield benefit to split them and turn them into 15. So the blue bar is the original stand in both scenarios. The orange bar is where we interceded, and the white bar is the kind of replant, simulated replant. In 30s, there was about a two and a half bushel benefit to interceding. The other benefit in that scenario was you get some more plants out there to compete against the weeds. Now, in the 15 inch row beans, the original stand was, was still the winner, even with thin, thin stands. So, just something to think about here. I would never want to, I'm not a big proponent of ever tearing up and starting completely over. Take advantage of the ones that are out there that, are, that have gotten you some light interception early. I'm getting the, the hook here pretty quick, so I'm gonna speed through a couple things. This is maturity groups. Um, you can see the data here. It's early season, uh, mid, or mid early plantings, mid-April, late April. The long season beans in the red bar are out yielding the when we're in the May planting dates, it's almost a wash as we get later back to long season beans. Kind of the story I, I gave you a little bit ago. A couple other things that are kind of interesting data points. <clears throat> we look at 
we have a, our group hand harvest 60, had, had a hand harvest 60 plants out of each one of our planting dates and different maturity groups and they counted where every pod was on every plant. Talk about not wanting to meet somebody in a dark alley. I don't want to meet those two guys because they counted plants from September to Christmas, hand, hand counted. Uh, interesting things that came out of that. You see the, the decrease in total nodes per plant as you plant later. You don't get as many nodes per plant. That's why we make up, with it, make up for it with more plants. Also, look at average seeds per pod. No difference based on planting date. You can't, we, we have done all kinds of stuff to try to influence seeds per pod. Very, very difficult to do. Focus more on getting more pods and getting bigger seeds. Nodes five through 16 give you 80 to 85% of your yield. The middle of the plant. That also came from all of the hand counting of, of pods. So if you're gonna look at an area you wanna protect, that's the part of the plant you wanna protect. Because when this happens, it's, it's a bad day. When I was riding with Randy Dowdy this summer, I noticed his fields in Georgia were very clean, very little insect feeding. I said, Randy, what's your threshold for making a treatment? He stopped the truck. He's a bit of an intimidating guy. And he said, AJ, no, it's, it's warm. I, I don't want anybody. I said, okay, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so he's big into managing, managing pests. Uh, when you lose pods, it's not a good day. Doesn't take much seed weight. It doesn't take much seed weight to get more yield. Two milligram increase in seed weight will give you a bushel. A dollar mill weighs a thousand milligrams. Put that in perspective. Doesn't take much. Just keep the plants green as long as you can and get as much photosynthetic activity as you can out of them. So this can be done with agronomics. It can be done with some products as well. This was a, a, a MDVI we took before we had sprayed some fungicide this year on a 50 variety trial. We were planning to spray the bottom half of this with Reaxor and Fast Pack. When I looked at this first image, I thought there's sure not much going for us here. The south half doesn't look as good. But we went ahead and sprayed the south half about 10 days later, came back and flew again in late August, and you can see what a difference that made in the, in the health. That's how we get more seed weight. That's how we're trying to drive you know, long season photosynthetic activity skip this. That was my one advertising slide, but I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to advertise to you today. It's your lucky day. <laughs> no advertising. Success builds confidence. Uh, just to kind of wrap this thing up, one of the biggest critics I had in, in what I was doing, the guy that thought I didn't know what the heck I was talking about, was my own dad. Any of the younger guys ever, ever have that experience of saying, man, I want to try this, and dad going, nah, you ain't trying that. The only way I got to, to really push for early planted beans was I had to go buy a planter. That was, that was the deal. If I bought the planter and I went and planted them, then I could plant some early beans. So I did it. And uh, my dad said, what you're doing in Champaign, Illinois, on Black Dirt will never work down in our hills and, and woods around us, and et cetera, et cetera. Planted April 18th. You can see everything we did in that case. Uh, we, I am a big believer in variable rate fertility ahead of soybeans. Um, we fertilize ahead of both crops. You can see some of the other practices, and guess what? We got a half inch rain in August. My dad was laughing at me. Ha ha! You were wrong again. I'm gonna be right. Early planted beans aren't gonna be any good. He called me when I was driving to Michigan. Um, he was taking out the first field of beans. I'm gonna show the yield map. Don't look at the field average because it wasn't calibrated yet, but look at the the running average in this field, and that was calibrated. And half inch rain in August. We're a week away from a drought all the time. There's woods around our fields. Maybe a little bit tough to see, but he sent me this video and said, AJ, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we've all out enough trucks that these might make over 85 bushel. I've, I've never had a field make over 75 before. I think maybe you might know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost had a heart attack on the road. <laughs> Probably one of the best validation moments in my career. It's that car right there. A uh, few closing thoughts. Obviously, budgets are tight. Everybody wants to plant soybeans everywhere I go. People are asking about beans on beans and planting more beans because we can make some profit there. There's opportunities to do it without uh, without having to break the bank on ROI. 
It takes good agronomics, good crop management to do it. We love environmental cooperation. That makes it even better. That big bean there, they have a, it's the coolest thing. I, I just wish we could do this in the U.S. They have the biggest bean festival in South America. Doesn't that sound fun? Big bean festival. So they all go out and try to grow the biggest bean. That was the winter. It had something well over 3,000 pods in one plant. Uh, my comment is always, if there's any equipment guys in the room, I, more than anything, and I hate changing sickle sections. We can hate it. Anytime we're breaking sickle sections and I got to change them, I try to find that. <laughs> uh, if I tell the equipment guys, we're going to start growing beans like this, and you're going to have to figure out how to chop them down. That breaks the signal sections because I'm not changing them every round. So, uh, kind of a joke, but at the same time, there's potential in these soybeans through man. Last slide, we started planting for 2018. It happened in 2017. We put some beans in the ground on December 4th. So, <laughs> if we don't break it this time, I'm out. I don't know. I give up. I think we're going to break it, but we did we did some work with some experimental polymers. Uh, we're going to try a few things, so stay tuned. If you see me again down the road, I'll let you know how the December beans turned out. <laughs> so I hope you took a few things away. I know I jetted through a lot there. Appreciate your attentiveness and time. I'll turn it back over to Dave.